So thanks to all of our, our, um, our speakers today. So we'll be moving on to the panel Q&A where we'll go through some of the sort of pre-submitted questions in addition to, to, to the ones that have, uh, have been submitting over, over the, the last uh, 40 minutes or so. So we'll just welcome everyone back. Brilliant. Uh, so uh, we've got one question here. Thinking about the future of Agile, if you had to pick one thing that's changed about Agile during the pandemic that you think will continue going forwards, what would that one thing be? So um, I'll start just coming to, to, to Natalie, if that's OK. Uh, so if you could pick one thing that's changed about Agile during the pandemic that you think will continue moving forwards, what would that be? I think I think we've all talked about this a little bit. I think the biggest thing for me will be the co-location principle will not always be the de facto starting position. I think, I think we've learned that it's one model, but there are others that can be effective. Absolutely, as, as uh, Darren kind of touched on uh, most recently, and and and, Kat, and and sorry, and Matt before that as well. Uh, Helen, uh, any any kind of additional thoughts to that from a from a kind of service design perspective? Yeah, I really hope that the the communication continues and that that um, curious mindset of of wanting to learn more and talk to more people. Um, I don't know if that's just stemmed from being very lonely in lockdown and you wanted that human contact, yeah. but it seems to have been a lot easier to contact um, colleagues, regardless of it's your internal team or external teams, there seems to be a lot more dialogue going on. So I really hope that continues. That's a really interesting point. Not something I've thought about, but I think that is definitely true. Thank you. Uh, so the next question that we've got here, um, as work evolves into an even more remote setting, what safeguards do you think we should put in place to manage our work-life balance? Uh, so, Matt, can you hear your your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting one. So I was I was thinking before this panel about the, the kind of best analogy that I could come up with with respect to how things have changed and. Uh, I came to the decision that nothing's changed um, in terms of one respect. So you can imagine you go to a, go to a coffee shop. Um, everybody expects to be treated the same. But if everybody goes to the coffee shop and gets a cup of tea, that's going to be a poor experience. Everybody wants something a little bit different, but they all want to be treated fairly. Um, what we've learned during the during the pandemic is people have got different needs and different wants so i'd said particularly at the beginning of the pandemic it was a very much a double-edged sword and natalie talked about that as well that home work school all of those things were the same place um we we, we were unable to leave the office we were unable to to start having fun at home because it was all, all in the same place but everybody has got different experiences and different reasons and justifications for wanting it to work in a certain way. So I, as a you know person who's, who's got a child at home, I need to work around school and things like that. But that doesn't mean that I should have more flexibility compared to somebody who doesn't have that situation. We should all be be allowed to work as as we as we see fit. I, uh, before I joined GL, I was working on a team, and we were just following on from what Darren was saying, we were globally distributed. My team spanned 16 hours of time zone. It went from San Diego to Perth in Australia. And by working from home, it meant that I was willing to do a 5 a.m. call and an 11 p.m. call because during the day I would I would do other things. I would go and do a bit of homeschooling or, or, or whatever. Um, it's more, I would say, more to do with office working um, that I think that the biggest change has been, and, and it's just that people want the flexibility to manage things as they see fit. And, and it, we have things like core hours where we, we kind of all get together and collaborate at the same time. But something I've learned is collaboration isn't a continuous thing. You do not have to collaborate of every minute of the working day to be effective. You do a bit of collaboration, then I'll actually go and do some work, some focus work, and then I'll collaborate for a bit. Um, it, you know, traditionally in the office, it was expected that collaboration was just 
endless. I could go and stop people as they were working, go and interrupt them with a with a little question, whereas now I have to wait. And and that's okay. It's actually proved to be okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. I really like what you said um earlier as well. Kind of we need to treat everybody fairly, but also kind of meet individual needs as well. Thank you. Um okay. So we've got two questions here that that, that kind of are, are tied together. Um, so how do you make sure that everyone still has an equal voice in a hybrid slash remote, uh, sorry, a hybrid remote slash local team? Um, so I'll ask that first. Um, Darren, um, as, as a scrum master who facilitates a lot of the uh, a lot of the ceremonies, how do you make sure that, that people do have an equal voice? It's about sure, making sure um, everyone is in their comfort zone. Um, and for me, uh, it comes back to the, the debate about cameras on, cameras off. Um, in, a, in an office environment where you've got everybody gathered around in a group, there are going to be some people who are going to feel the pressure of that group more than others. And you'll naturally get some people who won't want to speak up. You can encourage them as much as you like, but they'll still sort of fade into the background and, and be more listening than participating. Um, one of the advantages that I've seen with um, cameras on, cameras off is just give people the ability to turn their cameras off. Uh, if that makes them feel more comfortable in their environment, then it may encourage them to speak up more. Um, the other thing that's that's been quite good is that people are at home in their own environments. They're in their own comfort zone, so to speak. So they are more relaxed and found it easier to encourage people to, to speak up, to give everyone a chance um, to speak up as well. Uh, and that's, that's been quite, quite encouraging. Yeah, can, I, can I just add something onto that as well? And um, I, I remember um, I've watched far too many episodes of Friends and there was an episode where, uh, where Chandler was feeling excluded because he didn't smoke and what would happen is the, the group would go out for a smoking break and come back having made all the decisions. Whilst, you know, that that's, that's obviously a, a, a ridiculous analogy in terms of the office for, for many people, that, that does, that did happen where people would kind of in the office, oh, we're, we're having a chat and then we've told you um, what we've decided. And that's something you, you, you do need to be aware of and people need to be aware of themselves that if, if they kind of behave in that way, then people can feel excluded as a result of that. And this, the kind of the next question leads in perfectly. And it's some people are already returning to, to the office and, and Natalie gave an example uh, earlier on. Um, albeit, you know, maybe only a, a few days a week in, in some cases, how difficult is it going to be to communicate with some of the team face to face and some of the team remote, which kind of leads into your point, Matt, about potentially people having a conversation and if, some, if they're in the office, they're having that conversation and maybe have made a decision, but somebody's working at home and hasn't kind of been party to that conversation. I, I, I was going to say, I, I would like to, to, to add, I don't know about anybody else, but I found when we were all working remotely, it was a very much level playing field that everybody had the same opportunities. We we're all having the same technology, we all had the same dogs barking in the background and so forth. But when we started using the office, as I've, I've certainly been doing, it's bust things again. And I, I get very frustrated when will we'll dad into an office and so-and-so's at the back of the room and you can't quite hear them. Um, and Phoebe had, had put a, a comment on chat there. Uh, I can see that um, talking about talking over people, um, you know, it's something we've got to be quite aware of and try, we have to force sometimes a bit more inclusivity um, in our communication, something we need to be a lot, lot more aware of. So it's certainly worse in certain circumstances than others. Mm -hmm. Can, can I add to that? I, I, I've, I've been having a series of light bulb moments about this in the last um, couple of weeks <clears throat> with the hybrid going into the office. And uh, some clever people in my office have kind of sorted the tech. So actually you almost forget where a person is. So rather than being in a meeting room where you've got like tiny specks of a person. So like one of these screens has got the table and you can't see anybody or see their faces and, you know, 
Um, we've been, the people in the room have been turning their cameras on on their laptops and using a jabber in the room to stop the feedback. So sound off, mic off, some sort of speaker, some sort of wireless speaker connected to the things. And then the remote people and the people in the room are actually all looking at the same thing. Some of them, you know, they look up and they make eye contact across the table. But essentially, it means that the people who aren't actually in the room have got the same level of visibility of facial expressions for everybody that's there and actually to some extent if you're in the room you forget when you're talking to a person whether they're in the room or not in the room occasionally you'll get the back of somebody's head because they've turned to look at the screen but most of the time they talk to the version of the person that's in front of them so for me that's been really quite I don't I'm not quite sure why I didn't think of it sooner to be honest I'm a bit like duh I feel like we should have figured this out sooner but um and it wasn't even me so I can't even take the credit but for me that's really turned the corner between there being a conversation going on around a table while the view of floating faces watch it in the background, which is how it kind of felt up until that point. But the turn your camera on and then effectively talk to your laptop where the other people are represented has made a really massive difference. So I'd urge you all to give that that sort of combination of things a go. I would I would completely agree and echo that. Um, one of the easiest things to do is if you've got half your team in the office and half your team at home, have everyone still dial into the meeting individually. Uh, and face the camera um, that way everybody's still on that level playing field yeah, yeah interesting and not 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 an approach that i'd kind of thought about before but yeah definitely one that's worth trying uh, so next question we have here do you think running agile ceremonies works better remotely or in person so uh helen uh, any any thoughts on that from from yourself? Yeah, um, personally speaking, I've got I'm currently in a bit of a, a blended strategy team rather than just a day to day scrum delivery. Um, so it's two different. It's almost two different entities. You've got the day to day delivery, um, walk in the wall, all of that. Um, and uh, personally speaking, I've found that really helpful being online because it means everybody's, like we've talked before, everybody's getting the same viewport, everybody's experiencing the same thing. Um, from uh, the ceremonies kind of going online from a, a strategic delivery perspective, it's almost been harder because a lot of that is like, oh, and what about this? And what about this? And it's a little bit less structured and that can cause a bit of a free for all, if, <laughs> if I'm honest. So I think it, it is the skill sets of people like Darren to, to try and order the teams. Um, and, it, and I think it definitely means it's shone a spotlight in people who can organize people's thoughts really well. Um, and sometimes that can get a little bit crowded if you're not if you haven't got a really really good taskmaster of of like what, of what you're supposed to be doing yeah and darren I'll, I'll come to you on that from a from a scrum master facilitation perspective how, how 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 can you do that oh um it's about giving everybody their voice it's about doing the same thing you would do in an office environment but online there are um we're still using the same sorts of tools we still have boards with our work on them we still have collaboration areas we can use we still have um, the ability to have uh, communication between different uh, different areas of the team with things like slack and team chats so it's about using these tools to facilitate the same sort of thing that you would have in the office um, I think about the only thing I really miss um, are the water cooler moments um, we don't have that that you know meeting someone over the microwave in the kitchen sort of environment you know sitting outside in the sun with the sandwiches on the bench just chatting away with someone miss those sorts of moments but um it's about just keeping in touch with people making sure everybody's got the ability to talk to everyone else and feels comfortable doing that in whatever environment they're in uh, and just being flexible around that so that everybody's got the ability to do what they need to do um Tools, online tools have, have come a long way um, in um, in the in the pandemic during lockdown. Um, there's a lot more available now um, to facilitate meetings. A lot more stuff is online that you can use um, to replace the things that you would have done in the office over whiteboards and post-it notes. So, 
Um, it's just about making sure you've got you've got everything you need to 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 keep facilitating those 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 meetings and ceremonies and you know conversations that need to happen. And that that brings us nicely onto one of, one of the other questions that has been submitted. Um, so, what tools to help everyone working from home would you recommend or not recommend? Um, so, Natalie, perhaps I'll come to yourself first. I know we've had some conversations previously about this. I, I still don't feel anybody's completely cracked it. There are stuff out there. Um, so we're mural users. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, I'd like to be able to just spin up a second window alongside this and start writing on it. And that doesn't really exist. And if you can, it, it, you type and it's tiny and weeny and people can't also type. But it just like I feel like the big providers have missed a trick on some of this stuff. And maybe it's because they're scratching their heads and it's turned out to be really, really hard. And, you know, maybe five years after we've all forgotten the pandemic, they'll finally come through for us. But I, I feel like we want you want something that's kind of interoperable with the other things you need. It needs to be easily accessible. It needs to be easily sorable. Ideally, you don't want different user accounts for everything. You want to be able to seamlessly. It wants to be part of a suite of tools you're using all the time where you can move content across. And I feel like, some efforts have been made, but we've not invested as much in it as perhaps we could do. So teams have come up with their own stuff. So, so I'm personally disappointed by the uh, the wider tech industry in terms of how they failed to really rise to the challenge in this. Because I think, you know, I think given the, the obvious imperative and need, um, I feel like by now I'd expect something amazing where I'm going, have you seen this thing? It's amazing. I can like, people can talk, people can write, you can pause it, you can record it, you can copy it, you can annotate it. But there's, you know, different things for all of those things, which is kind of frustrating and not very efficient. Sorry. So a moan from me, a big thumbs down from me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, tool. I would say I'm quite happy having, having been able to type all my words in. You haven't seen my handwriting. So maybe that's a good thing, not a bad thing. <laughs> and and Matt, how about yourself? Um, any tools that you would or wouldn't recommend? I, uh, I, I, thanks for putting me on the spot on that one. Um, <laughs> I think I found a lot of tools that workish, and just echoing what what Natalie says, nothing's perfect. And and to be fair, I mean, I, I found Microsoft Teams a very very frustrating experience right in the, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but it seems as though Microsoft, to be fair to them, have doubled down <laughs> uh, since then and, and put a lot of effort into, into things working, uh, getting things working. And there's certainly lots of features that have come about over the last 12 months uh, have been very, very appreciative of. Um, I, th I think that the main thing that Natalie, just to echo once again what Natalie was saying, is just about integration because the last thing I want is yet another tool. Mm -hmm. I've got enough disparate communication tools, thank you very much, whether it's SharePoint, whether it's Teams, whether it's um, um, Miro or um, Confluence, the list goes on. And the last thing I need is another one. Um, I just want the one that brings all of these things together for me perfectly so I can find everything everywhere. Um, if you can knock me up one of those, I'll be, uh, be very interested. <laughs> Great. Uh, we've had a, a message um, here. Some artifacts of Gen are actually better. Um, they like the greater preeminence and uniformity of online collaboration environments like Miro remains as a reference point and no handwriting to decipher so we can avoid Darren's handwriting as well. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, it's a good point, actually, because if you don't have to dictate what you all agreed on a whiteboard, then that's time back in the bank. So if we've all written it down in the electronic tools, great, nobody needs to take all those post-it notes and write them down into a, into a document or dictate them in some other shape or form. You've already agreed them. Everybody saw them. Everybody understood them. And we can go back and reference. Brilliant. Well, that takes us to uh, about the end of the panel Q&A time. Uh, so thank you to uh, all of our guests today. Uh, and thank you for everybody who's attended the session as well. Um, if there are any extra questions that we haven't been able to get to, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to, to reply to them directly as well. Um, so yeah um just once again big thank you to all of our speakers and um we'll be sending out a survey shortly for anybody who'd like to help us with feedback maybe some ideas for future sessions as well 
um, and a recording of the event afterwards too. So thanks again and see you all soon.